Hello everyone. Here is our first of several examples today that is going to require a little bit different integral calculus than the definite integrals we've been working on the last couple of days. So here's example one. We want to know the position of an object at three seconds if its velocity is given by v equals 2t squared plus 4 with the appropriate units on the numbers, of course, on the coefficients. Uh, so if we look at this problem, notice that this is different than the definite integrals, right? The definite integrals, we don't get a single velocity or a single position, right? We get the change in the velocity or we get the displacement over some time interval, right? So this is more reminiscent of what we did, say, with derivatives, right? Where we would take a position function and then we would take the derivative of that position function with respect to time to find the entire velocity function, and then we could evaluate that at any time, right? We'd start with some position function, take a derivative, get a velocity function, and, and then evaluate it at any t that we wanted to find the velocity. It was a more powerful thing because we were getting out the entire function, not just a definite answer between particular limits of integration, right? between particular times. So basically, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find what we might call, for a few minutes at least, an antiderivative. We're trying to do something that is exactly the inverse, if you will, of taking a derivative. This is going to be a little bit different, as we're going to see. Well, we know that the integral seems to lead us in that direction, right? even the definite integrals that we were doing the other day. Certainly, we could go from the acceleration graph to some information about the velocity right, by taking an integral, definite integral. We could go from a velocity time graph to displacement by taking a definite integral. So let's start out by seeing what we can figure out about the position by taking the integral of the velocity function with respect to time. Now note, this is not a definite integral because we have no limits of integration. So if we plug in our function in this example, 2t squared plus 4 with respect to t, right, we can uh, take the integral here. Um, I'm going to do this fairly quickly. If you want some steps, go ahead and write them out. Um, first off, this is the integral of a sum, and the integral of a sum is a sum of the integrals. In other words, I'll take the integral of each part one at a time. Power rule says add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. So we add one here, and which would give us 3 and divide by 3. Here we add 1 to the exponent, which is really a t to the 0, right? So we get a t over here divided by 1, and we get 2 thirds t cubed plus 4t. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. That is the integral rule. Now, is this then a function, a position function, which corresponds to this velocity function? Well, if we want to figure that out, we can simply take the derivative to c. Because we already have established that the velocity is simply the derivative of the position function with respect to time. So if we take the derivative of this, multiply by the exponent, subtract 1 from the exponent. 3 times 2 thirds is 2, subtract 1 from 3. Over here we have 4 times 1, subtract 1 from 1, you get t to the 0, which is 1, and we get 2t squared plus 4. Well, this then is our original velocity function. So it appears that this is the position function that gives rise to this velocity function. Or have we found the right function? What if instead of this position function, we thought the position function was 2 thirds t cubed plus 4t plus 5? So I just threw a plus 5 on the end. What if this was it? Would this work? Well, let's see. If we take the derivative of this function with respect to time, what do we get? Well, multiply by 3, subtract 1, multiply by 1, subtract 1. What's the derivative of 5? It's a constant. So the rate of change of a constant is 0. So we get 
a velocity of 2t squared plus 4. Well, that's our velocity function. So it seems this function also works. This one does, but so does this one. Hmm. What if our position function was 2 thirds t cubed plus 4t minus 10? Which just means that we start at, you know, negative 10 position. Well, take the derivative and let's check it. Derivatives haven't really changed here and here. What's the derivative of minus 10? 10 is a constant. Derivative of a constant? 0. And this function also seems to work. Well, let's think this through here, right? As long as we just throw on a constant, the derivative of a constant is always 0. So that means that any function that looks like this, 2 thirds t cubed plus 4t plus c, capital C, which is the symbol we're going to use for constant, hey, there we go, c for constant, that any function of this form will work. Any function of this form will give you this velocity function, because whatever the constant is, the derivative of that with respect to time, is zero. Creating this function is called an indefinite integral. Indefinite integral. It has an indefinite answer. Right? It gives you the function back. This is a more powerful thing in many ways than a definite integral. Right? There are no limits of integration. So this is saying the integral of a function with respect to x is the integral of that function plus a constant. And this is something that you, you know, in math class, people often forget the plus c part of it, right? You got to have that plus c on there. Because that function with any extra constant added on is going to give you the original function back when you take a derivative. So this is, if you will, our antiderivative, right? more specifically called an indefinite integral. Still follows all the integral rules that we learned for definite integrals, except we're not evaluating it. Uh, at the upper limit minus the lower limit. Okay, we're adding on this constant, and that gives us a function answer. So this is what is called a, a family of solutions. Okay, um, if you drew this out on a graph, you would have an infinite number of curves, all just different by a constant. Right, they would basically be the same, but shifted up and down the axis depending on what the constant is, right? We shift it up or down. Well, we generally aren't going to want an infinite number of solutions. We're going to want a particular solution, right? One answer to this question. But we can't get one answer to this question from the problem statement as is. We need an extra bit of information, all right, to be able to do an indefinite integral. And that is what we call an initial condition. We need to know something about the, uh, the position at some particular time. Okay? If we know something about the position, if we know one position at a particular time, we can figure out what this constant has to be to make both that true and to give us this velocity function. Here's what I mean. Let's suppose that at zero seconds, this object is at five meters. Okay, now normally this would have to be given in the problem statement, okay? So somehow we know one time, we know that at the beginning at zero seconds, we know that it's at five meters. Well, if that's true, then what does this function say our constant has to be given this initial condition? Let's evaluate it. X evaluated at zero is five meters. So if we plug in zero for T here and zero for T there, right, plus our constant, this is kind of the easiest initial condition because of the zero, right? So zero here cancels out, zero here cancels out, and so the constant must be five meters. Plug that back into our function, and we have what we call a particular solution, right, to the question. This is the only function which has this velocity function and satisfies our initial condition that at zero seconds, the object's at five meters. 
any of those other functions we had, you plug in a zero, you won't get five meters, right? Plug in zero time, you won't get five meters. So this is the only solution. So notice here that to do an antiderivative, an indefinite integral, if you will, we need an extra piece of information, okay? We need to know something about the integral, right? We need to know something about the function that we're going to find. Right? We need to know an initial condition. Oh, by the way, once we get to this point, finding the position at any time is rather trivial. You just plug in the value of time, right, and do the math. So at three seconds, we plug in three for time, right, in both places. Don't forget the plus five, the initial condition, the constant, if you will. And you work out to be, to two sig figs, 35 meters if you do everything and work it out, right? So notice, a little more complex than just taking a derivative because we need that initial condition to collapse our infinite family of solutions down to a particular solution that satisfies both the initial condition and the function. Two things we need to, be, to do here. Okay, so let's do another example here. What is the velocity of an object at two seconds whose acceleration is given by this function? And again, don't worry so much about the units. It's 6t minus 6t squared. If, here's the initial condition, at four seconds, the velocity is negative 90 meters per second. Now, this isn't as easy of an initial condition because it's not at zero seconds. It's not the initial velocity, if you will, right? But it is a velocity. We happen to know for some reason that at four seconds, it was moving to the left at 90 meters per second. And as long as we know one velocity, right, we can do this problem. So we have an acceleration function. We want to get to the velocity function, right? That's one step up on the kinematic stack of graphs. So we have to take an integral. The velocity is the indefinite integral of the acceleration with respect to time. Right? It's an indefinite integral, so no limits of integration. We plug in the function. Note here I have gotten rid of the units which will work out properly when you work them out at the end, right? So we uh, take the integral of the difference is the difference of the integrals. So we take the integrals one piece at a time. In each case, we add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. I chose very nice numbers here to make a nice function come out. You will see as we do these as that, that you end up with a lot of fractions when you're doing indefinite integrals integrals in general, whether definite or indefinite, you end up with lots of fractions because you add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. So unless your co coefficient is divisible evenly by that new exponent, you're going to end up with a fraction. So be it, right? That's how the math works. So here we add one to the exponent, we'd get a 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3. Here we add one to the exponent, that would be 3. 6 divided by 3 is 2. So we get 3t squared minus 2t cubed plus c. Don't forget the constant. This, then, is the infinite family of solutions that give rise to this acceleration. But if I actually want to have one solution to be able to figure out the acceleration at two seconds, I now need to employ my initial condition in order to figure out what the constant is. So, I evaluate the function at 4 seconds, and I know that I'm going to get negative 90 meters per second. So I plug in 4 here, I plug in 4 there. Okay. And if I do the algebra correctly, don't lose the squared and the cubed, I get a constant in this case of negative 10 meters per second. If I plug that back into our velocity function, we get the particular solution. This function, 3t velocity is 3t squared minus 2t cubed minus 10. This function does two things. If you take the derivative, you'll get this acceleration function back, but it also satisfies this initial condition. If you plug four seconds in here and here, you will get negative 90 meters per second for the velocity. So this is our single particular solution that fits both. Once we have this velocity function, finding the velocity at any time, 
We can make a graph if we wished, right? But finding the velocity at any time is really just plugging in the times. So indefinite integrals are the more powerful integral here, okay? But unfortunately, we kind of have two types we got to deal with. Definite integrals, which gives us the area under the curve, right, for um, a particular, uh, sorry, for definite uh, limits of integration, right, between this time and that time, say, in our examples. And then indefinite integrals, which give us an entire function back, but we need to know an initial condition in order to be able to complete the indefinite integral. So here then, if we just want to answer the question, right, we want to find the, the uh, velocity, sorry, at t equals two seconds, we plug in a two, we do the algebra, and we get negative 14 meters per second. So at two seconds, this object happens to be traveling to the left at 14 meters per second. One dimensional motion, right? And we could find any other time we wanted. And in fact, we could even graph this and we'd get a single curve Right? That would be the velocity as a function of time. Example three. Here is a velocity function, a little more complex, 2t squared minus 3t minus 2. And our initial condition, we're starting at zero. So at time zero, we're at position zero, probably the simplest initial condition you could get. So a couple of parts to this problem. This problem kind of mimics a very typical multiple choice problem on the actual AP test. Okay, uh, it's gonna have a couple of different parts to it, two or three parts to it usually. It gives you one velocity function to start out with and then asks you several questions that are going to test your ability to do some calculus and to apply the calculus, of course. So first I wanna know the particle's position at three seconds. Well, we've got the velocity function so how do you find the position function when you have the velocity? You take the indefinite integral. The position is the indefinite integral of the velocity with respect to time. Usually, by the way, we drop the indefinite and we just say integral of velocity with respect to time, but sloppy language, but still generally the way it's done. We plug in that velocity function, add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent in all three cases, and we get 2 thirds t cubed minus 3 halves t squared minus 2t, and don't forget the plus c. Right? We got that constant here to make this the infinite family of solutions that will all work. You take the derivative of this, you get the original function back. So what is our constant? Well, we happen to know that at zero time, we started at zero position, the world's most straightforward initial condition. So if we evaluate it, at zero time, we're at zero position. We plug in zeros for all of these, and the constant is zero. Plug a zero back in, and there's our function. This is the only position function which both gives this velocity function and satisfies that initial condition, our particular solution. So if we want to find the position at three seconds, we just evaluate this at three and we get about negative one and a half meters if you play with all the uh, fractions here. Right? This little half is gonna pop out in this one, so you gotta be careful. Like I said earlier, you tend to get a lot of fractions when doing integrals. So that's part A. Part B, I wanna know the particle's acceleration at three seconds. Well, if we have the velocity function, how do we find the acceleration? Well, sure, we take the derivative, right? The acceleration is the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. It's the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. See how they can kind of get both types of calculus into one uh, problem? Multi-part, but you know, so it'll be worth several points on an AP test, but usually there's something of this kind of variation on there. So we take the derivative, subtract one from the, or sorry, multiply by the exponent, subtract one from the exponent, right? Take them one piece at a time. Hopefully by now you're better at this than integrals. And we get 4t minus 3. There's no constant or anything here. Life is good. We evaluate it at 3 seconds. 4 times 3 is 12, minus 3 is 9. So the acceleration at 3 seconds is 9 meters per second squared. 
course, realize sometimes I've seen a part C, which would be something like, what's the net force acting at three seconds? And they have to tell you the mass because net force is mass times acceleration. Oh, see, now they're throwing in a little extra Newton's second law thing into the problem as well. But. So a typical kind of uh, multiple choice calculus-based APC problem where they give you a function and then maybe you have to take a derivative to find something, you have to take an indefinite integral to find something. But that way they get to check whether you can do both integral and differential calculus. So here's part C. What's the particle's displacement from two to four seconds? Displacement means change in position. So two ways we could do this problem, okay? We already, way back here, have the position function. So we could find the position at two seconds, the position at three seconds, and then subtract them to figure out the displacement. Oh, sorry, four seconds, right? So we could find the position at four seconds, that would be your final position. Your position at two seconds, that would be your initial position. Subtract them, you have the displacement. Or we could just do a definite integral of the velocity with respect to time evaluated from two to four seconds. Right? This is a question we could have answered the other day. So let's do the calculus method of this. Why not, as if we hadn't done part A already. Hopefully by now these integrals are getting a little easier. If not now, they will by the time you're done with, uh, or by the time you get to the AP test in May, right? Um, these should get easier for you even if you're in first year calculus. And generally, you know, the functions are going to be more like this. They're not going to ask super complex functions uh, in these cases. So we do the integral. We get 2 thirds t to the third minus 3 halves t squared minus 2t. In this case, there's no constant because we're doing a definite integral. And then we have to evaluate it now at our limits of integration. So we evaluate it at our upper limit at 4 minus evaluating it at our lower limit of 2. And then it just becomes a bunch of math. Right? Now, notice here, do you see why I didn't have to deal with the constants when we were doing definite integrals? Because if you just add something onto the end of this function, when you do this subtraction, upper limit minus lower limit, you're just subtracting that part off. Again, what it's doing to the function is shifting it up or down on the axes. Right? So, if it shifts it up, let's say, you get a little bit more area underneath. But you get a little more, more area after two seconds and after four, and those little extra bits of area cancel out anyway. And so that's why we didn't have to deal with constants with definite integrals, just indefinite. If you work out all the fun fractions here, <laughs> 10 and 2 thirds minus a negative 4 and 2 thirds, and then add those, you get 15 meters. This is rounded off. You actually get 15 and a third, right? But two sig figs. So we round off to two. It's 15.33333, but 15 meters for our displacement. Sure, you could have taken this function, this function, right, that you found in part A, evaluated it at four, minus evaluating it at two. That's what displacement is. But this is just the calculus way, remember, of solving this problem. If I had given you this problem as part A, this is how you would have approached it. One more example here, and this one's a little interesting and takes us into uh, a little different area of physics. We have a ball, and we're going to throw it upward. And when it leaves our hand, it's going to be moving at a speed v sub o, that's our initial velocity, and it will be at a height y sub o. Y is vertical position, right? So this is our initial velocity and our initial position. These are our initial conditions. I want to know what's its position at some time I'm going to call T1. Right? So we're going to do this all symbolically here, very generic. Understand the problem? Now, we do have to um, uh, negate air resistance or neglect air resistance, sorry. Okay. So we've done lots of these kinds of problems, and we could actually figure out this answer using something that we've already derived graphically. But I want to do this in a calculus way. So what do we know about the motion of this object after it's thrown upward 
not while you're throwing it, but after you throw it. Well, what kind of motion is it going to have? It's going to have uniformly accelerated motion, right? And if we're near the surface of the Earth, that uniform acceleration will be our old friend little g. Technically, as a number, negative 9.8 meters per second squared, but I'm going to work the problem symbolically. Right? So I'm going to use g with an arrow. Well, if I know the acceleration, I can find the velocity function. And if I know the velocity function, I can find the position function, which is what we're going towards, right, by doing integrals. So let's first find the, uh, let's take the uh, integral of both sides. There's a couple different ways you can write this. But I'm taking this, this is what we know, and let's take the integral of both sides with respect to time. It's legal to do, right? You're doing the same thing to both sides of an equation. It stays equal. So we're taking the integral of this side, the integral of this side. Well, we already know that the integral of the acceleration with respect to time is just the velocity. The acceleration of g with respect to time, g is a constant, right? would be g times t plus a constant. Now, technically, there's a constant over here and there's a constant over here because we've taken two indefinite integrals, but we're just going to combine them together into one constant. Why not? Okay with that? So the integral of the acceleration with respect to time is the velocity. The integration of g, a constant uniform acceleration with respect to time, is just gt, and we have to add a constant. But we have an initial condition. We know that its initial speed is v sub o. Initial speed means at time zero. So at time zero, the velocity is v sub o. So if we plug in a zero for the time, that means our constant has to be v sub o. Plug it in, and we get v equals gt plus v sub o. Does that look like something you've seen before? I hope so. Now, when you've seen it in the past, we've flipped these two terms around, but it is addition. And we do know that vector addition is commutative. So V equals VO plus GT. Eh, that's the first kinematic equation. <laughs> Interesting. Right? Well, now that we've got the velocity function, what about the position function? Well, that would be another integral, right? If that's the velocity function. So let's take the integral of both sides again with respect to time. Don't be sloppy with your notation. You have to put in the dt as well. On the left-hand side, the integral of the velocity function with respect to time is just the position function. The right-hand side's a little more complex. We have to add one to the exponent. Sorry, yeah, add one to the exponent, divide by the exponent. Right? Technically, this is a t to the 0, right? So this is going to be vot. And this will be 1 plus 1 is 2, so 1 half gt squared plus c. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? So we get final vertical position equals initial velocity times time plus 1 half our acceleration times time squared plus a constant. But we know that its initial position is y sub o, its initial height that you're throwing it from, and that's at time 0. So if we evaluate the function at time 0, we get a constant of y sub o. Plug it in, and look what we get. Yeah, that is our old friend, the third kinematic equation. This is how you derive the kinematic equations with calculus, making only one assumption, and that assumption being the one we made at the very beginning of this process, that the acceleration is uniform given by little g. In fact, this was how, when I took uh, calculus-based physics, when my introductory level physics course as a physics major in college, when we got to the kinematic equations the first time, before we even knew what they were, this is how my professor derived them. None of all that graphing stuff and a nice lab like we did last year and all that kind of algebraic graphical approach. It was... Okay, now let's look at uniformly accelerated motion. And then we did some integrals. Right? And we came up at the end with some of the kinematic equations, and then we started applying them. If your prof does that in college, you'll be way ahead of the game knowing them already and having derived them both experimentally 
algebraically with graphs, right, and now even with calculus. If we then evaluate this function at t1, fairly trivial, right, we get the answer to our equation, right, to our problem. This is the position at t1. So again, just wanted to show you here how powerful right, integral calculus can be, just like differential calculus, when we're doing our, uh, our physics to apply it. Some different rules and derivatives, but again, some rules that you will have fleshed out much more once you get to calculus class right, so that we can apply them. And now we're, you know, we're going to practice this, okay? do a big old worksheet on doing these uh, definite and indefinite integrals, but we're then going to take this back into the realm of energy. And where we have seen areas under the curves, we are going to start to apply calculus so that we can look at more complex functions than the ones that we have previously seen. Enjoy.